Well, good morning, everyone. I hope you've had a good week so far. Lots to do in our time together today as we talk a little bit about um, looping is the one element of conditional code we have left to discuss that is at least primary in the ABAP programming language. And then we will move into internal tables, which will open up a gateway for a lot of uh, more advanced things that we will be able to do as the semester goes on. Your next homework assignment is actually up in D2L, but it won't actually open up for you to be able to see it until the end of our class period today. Um, there are, similar to your last homework assignment, two programs that you will be writing. Um, neither one of them are very long programs. You perhaps have already gotten a sense of the fact that ABAP programs can be fairly short. And so you do have another homework assignment that is uh, available. And like our last one, it will be due by Monday at 11.59 p.m. So the things that we cover really in the first portion of our time together today uh, should be sufficient for you uh, to do the things that are called for on the homework. And then the other things that we talk about uh, will be incorporated into your next homework assignment. I don't know that I have any announcements for you, but questions you folks have about anything as we're getting started here this morning. All right, well, I don't know if you have heard this particular statement in a class previously, but according to computer science theory, specifically to uh, researchers called Bohm and Giacopini, there are three things that a programming language has to support in order to be a fully powered programming language. It has to support sequence, which is simply the idea of telling a computer, do this, then do this, then do this, then do this, which clearly we have in ABAP. It has to support selection, which are things like if statements that allow us to create conditions that tell the computer to respond in certain ways according to certain inputs. And then the third, we have uh, sequence, selection, and iteration. Iteration is the ability to loop. And what we are going to talk about first off this morning is looping, which tells us that once we get past this, uh, we can write programs with a fair amount of sophistication. Now, along with that, there are actually three different kinds of looping that you see in programming languages. There is definite iteration, there is pretest iteration, and there is post-test iteration. Definite iteration means I know how many times I'm going to loop before I even begin executing the first loop. So the idea would be I might know that I'm going to need to loop 10 times, and so my loop would be constructed around the idea that I know I'm going around 10 loops. That's definite iteration. A lot of times with iteration, though, we don't know how many times we're going to go around. Maybe, for example, we ask the user for a value, and until the user gives us a value within the range that we have specified, we're going to keep asking the user for a value. And so if the user follows instructions the first time, we may only loop once, but if the user is stupid, or doesn't follow instructions well, we may loop for 10 years waiting for the user to type in a number that matches our definition. So with indefinite iteration, there are two different ways we could structure it. One is to set up a loop where the test is at the beginning of the loop, and the other way is to set up a loop where the test is at the end of the loop. Now, practically speaking, What's the difference between pretest iteration and post-test iteration? Post-test remember at least remember for at least one time. Exactly. With pretest iteration, I may not execute the body of the loop at all. With post-test iteration, I know I'm going to do the body of the loop at least once because I don't test until after my first time through the loop, if you will. So not every language gives us all three of those, but programming languages will typically give me at least two of these different types of, of loops. Well, let's look at this in the context of ABOP. ABOP gives us, as the definite iterator, the do statement. 
the do statement simply calls for us to create a loop where we explicitly state do whatever's in the body of our loop here a designated number of times. Now, where I have value, that could actually be a hard-coded number. I would suggest to you that hard-coding a, a literal number, sometimes those are called magic numbers, that's not good. But we could, for example, have a constant that we would define that we would put there, or that could be a variable. So we might see a statement like this. Do var a times, write out the word hi, and do. So the idea here is this loop is based on the fact that I know in advance exactly how many times I'm going to go around. This might be equivalent in other programming languages to a for loop, although a for loop also has a pretest iteration characteristics with it. So you might not have ever programmed in a language that has this kind of looping structure in it. But the rule of thumb is here, if I'm setting up a loop and I know that the number of times I will loop it is not variable. I know that I'm going to loop a set period of time. I use the do loop to accomplish that. The second kind of loop we have is a while loop. And you have undoubtedly seen this in other programming languages. A while loop begins with the keyword while. We have a condition that is stated. We have the body of the while loop. And then we have the statement end while that, that terminates this. So while var a is less than 10, var a equals var a times 2, end while. So clearly the idea here would be is let's say var a comes from user input and var a starts out as 2. 2 is less than 10, so I go in the body of the loop. I multiply var a times 2, which makes it 4. And then I hit the end of the loop, so I go back up to the top. 4 is still less than 10, so I multiply var a times 2 and set it now to 8 hit the end of the loop, go back up to the top, eight is still less than 10, so I go into the body of the loop one more time, eight times two is 16, hit the end, go back up to the top, 16 is no longer less than 10, so I fall out of the loop. Pretty straightforward logic there. We of course realize that if var a came from the user and the user put in the number 12, we would never multiply that times two because we would fail the initial test, var a would not be less than 10, 12 is not less than 10, so we just immediately jump to the end while statement and continue on with our coding logic. I think it's fair to say that while you haven't perhaps seen the first looping construct before, it's pretty straightforward and similar to things that you could envision using. And this second one is one that I'm sure you have seen and written many uh, examples of that in other programming languages in your experience. The next guy is a little bit different. This is the do loop. Now, that's distinct from the do times loop. And you'll notice right away where this starts out really different, a do loop just begins with the word do, period. Okay, so there's no specifying of values. There's no specifying of a test condition. We're just saying, okay, get ready because we're about to do something here. You have the body of the loop, which consists of however many lines of code you need it to be based on what it is you're doing in the loop here. And then you have an if statement. And that if statement is going to define what I'm going to call an abort condition. Or you could more reasonably think of it perhaps as an exit condition. And the idea here is, of course, if that condition is true, we enter the body of the if statement that contains the keyword exit. Now, there could, of course, be something in this if statement before exit, but the idea is that embedded in the do loop is a conditional code sequence 
that specifies an abort condition and uses the keyword exit as the way of breaking us out of the loop. So really, you could use this do loop like a post-test loop, and I would suggest to you that what I have here on the slide is pretty indicative of that. Understand, of course, that I could structure a do loop where I would have one or more statements, perhaps an abort condition test. Then I could have one or more statements and then another abort condition test. I could sequence the logic however I need to here. I could have multiple if clauses. But the idea is that what I have to account for is I have to have conditional code that has as a part of it an exit statement. What happens if I don't? Infinite loop. You know, if, if I don't have an exit statement here that's ever reachable, this loop is just going to keep going and going and going and going forever. Which, of course, with any looping structure, theoretically you could have an infinite loop, except for one of these. One of these guys can never have an infinite loop. Which one? The definite array, the first one. You know, I can't put do infinity times. I always have to put a number there could be a really big number, but the fact is the first loop up there has as its merit, we can never have an infinite loop for that guy. But these last two, clearly if we're not careful about our condition definitions, we could have a, an infinite loop situation. So here's an example of the do loop, uh, var a equals var a times 2. If var a is greater than 200, exit. Otherwise, let's let's keep going around again. Yes, sir. So a do loop will always have an exit. Absolutely, because this exit would have to be conditional. Otherwise, you'd only hit the you know you'd you'd break out of the loop the first time through, which means why did we need a loop in the first place? So yes, you are always going to have to see at least one conditional exit, and there's nothing that says you couldn't have more than one. But there has to be a way for that exit, for an exit statement to be reachable in the do loop. Otherwise, we're going to go around and around and around forever. Now, you will likely, at some point in your coding, code an infinite loop, presumably on accident. Let me explain to you what will happen at that point. First of all, you do not need to be terrified. I remember a previous semester where a student contacted me totally terrified because he had written a program with an infinite loop, couldn't figure out what to do, and was afraid the computer was just going to crash and be destroyed and everything else because it's not as apparent how you break out of it when you're working here in, in the environment like we are here. So let me tell you a couple of things. Thing number one is the computer, the the ABAP work processor will eventually realize it's in an infinite loop and it will kill itself. Now that may require it to loop for a couple of minutes, in which point, in which time, you're going to presumably not see any output on the screen and your SAP GUI is just going to kind of sit there working on stuff while the computer on the server side loops and loops and loops and loops and loops, but eventually it, it will stop. But presuming you don't want it to continue in that fashion, we do have an option here in the SAP GUI. In the very, very top left, there's this icon that you probably have never noticed before that vaguely looks like the SAP icon. If we click on that, you will notice that the very last option is stop transaction. That hits the brakes on an infinite loop. So you'll find that if you code up an infinite loop, most of the other buttons on your SAP GUI will be non-responsive, but that guy will still work. And you can click on that and use that to stop the transaction, which in this case is a program with an infinite loop in it. Now at that point, I hope you saved your program because even though it has an error in it, you probably don't want to start from scratch. If you didn't save it and you stopped the transaction, program's gone. Okay, so another good reminder to be sure to save your program.
as you are working. There's one thing that SAP gives us in the ABAP programming language that is somewhat unique, which is you undoubtedly are familiar with the concept of a loop counter. I'm sure you've used it dozens of times in other programs that you have written. And in every other language that I can think of, it was up to you as the programmer to create that variable and manage that loop counter. Well, in ABOP, the system does that for you. One of our SY, system maintained data objects, is a loop counter. SY-index allows us to check what iteration of a particular loop we actually are, are in. So let, let's write some code here and play around with some of these as an example and uh, think of any questions you guys might have for us to look at. And so I'm going to do this just for fun. Um, I'm going to allow the user to influence how many times we actually loop in our program. And we'll do the first one here, which is the, the definite iterator. So I'll put do var a times. And I'm going to write out here high. But beyond that, I, I want to um, put a uh, count of how many times I've executed this. So I'm going to come here and actually change this up a little bit. And I'm going to say, all right, every time we write something out, let's go to a new line. And then let's write out sy-index. And then after that, we'll write out the word high. And of course, the part that I am missing at this point is the end do statement. All right, so pretty straightforward program with definite iteration here. Um, so let me save this and let's execute this. And oh, I do this a lot. I want to butt something right up against that slash, and I'm not allowed to do that. So, all right, so if I put five, then I execute that value, one, two, three, four, five, high. Okay, once again, the reason why it indented there is because I'm printing out an integer and I did nothing to inhibit the width. So if I drop a star in parentheses in front of that, uh, just as an aside here, now we'll see that, gotta fix my spacing. Now we will see that if the user puts in 12 and executes, that we see what we see here. So the rule of thumb is, if you need a loop counter, don't create your own. Use the built-in ABOP loop counter because it's there already. And so for you to introduce your own variable um, is only going to add unneeded overhead to, to your program. Now do notice that even though we said this is a definite iterator, realize that the user could do this, do zero times, in which case my program does nothing. Uh, the user could also, this would be an interesting one, do negative two times. Let's see what happens there. Uh, nothing actually happened there. By the way, I don't know if you picked up on that, but I typed negative two, and when I executed it, um, ABOP changed that to two minus. ABOP puts the negative in a trailing position like this, unless we tell it to not to do that. If you ever write a program that does math, and you were to do five minus seven, it's very likely that ABOP would print out as the answer two with the minus sign after the two. It's just the, the output convention associated with, with negative numbers. So this is a do loop. Questions about this? Yes, sir. It's a great question and, and something that does come up with, with some regularity. The idea would be, let's just for the sake of making this really complicated, let's say I have uh, loop one and then end loop one. And then inside of that I have loop two 
and end loop two. And then I have loop three and then end loop three. All of these loops have SY index associated with it. But while I'm sitting, let's say right here, I'm in only loop one at this point, SY index is going to be the counter for loop one. As soon as I enter loop two, my ability to see loop one's index counter goes away. It's hidden or shadowed, and all I can see is the index counter for loop two. And similarly, once I hit loop three, the other two still exist, but I can't really see them. I can only see the index counter associated with loop three, which does mean that sometimes when I need visibility, perhaps of multiple loop counters, I am going to have to resort to my own user managed variable for that. And so I can do that. So the rule of thumb is sometimes you will need to introduce your own loop counter, but if you don't have to, then you want to rely on the one that the system provides. And, and just to be clear, once loop three ends and you return inside of loop two. You see that one. Remember. Yes. Yeah, and then when you go back into loop three for the next iteration, the loop three counter gets reset and and you just the other the other counters still exist, you just can't see them. Yes. It will exit the loop that it is in. And you can, as we, I think we have on an upcoming slide here, you can code in an exit condition even in, a, in, a, in any of the loops. You have to do it with the, just, with the do loop. But you can put it in the do times loop and in the while loop as well. So do loop. Um, I think unless anyone has questions, we certainly will write programs with the other loops in it, but I don't feel the need right now for us to spend a lot of time writing trivial programs for this. Um, any concepts about this um, fuzzy or questionable at this point? All right, so getting to the question really that was just raised, which is there are two statements that I can put in any of my looping constructs. One of those is the exit statement, which we've already seen we have to have in the do loop. The, when an exit occurs, the loop exits immediately and all iteration is done. And I jump to the statement that follows the loop block. So let, let's play around with that for a second here. If I were to come back to this program right here and let me introduce a couple things. One is after my loop, I'll put in a write statement that says write done. All right, so that'll now appear after I exit the looping. And then I'll put in kind of a special case here that says if sy dash index equals 14, then I will exit. And what you will have to make sure you always include here is an end if statement. So I can't give you a compelling reason as to why someone would want to write their program this way, but just as an illustration of, of the concept here, what we'll now see, of course, is if I run this program and the user puts in six, then we get six highs and then the word done. But if the user puts in the number 21, then I get 14 highs and the word done. It's just, it broke me out of the loop when it hit the 14th iteration, okay? So exit gives me a way to break out of the loop in a special condition. 
Now, one of the things that I didn't mention before is I can use SY index as a variable in my, in my test for my conditional loop. So here you see while SY index is less than 10, write out SY index. If, oh, and I don't think I told you, continue, what it does is it, it short circuits the current loop and jumps us back up to the next iteration. So what's going to happen here is it's going to write, oh, and the question is, is it going to write one or is it going to write zero there? What's it going to write? <laughs> you just saw the answer to that if you were paying real close attention. It's going to write one. ABOP counts starting with one because this is your first time through the loop. So it's going to say, okay, uh, I'm on loop index. You know, as soon as it sees the word while, it, it initializes SY index to one. And it's going to say, okay, write out one. One is less than three. So I jump back up to the top. As soon as I jump back up to the top, SY index gets incremented. And so now I'm going to write out two. Or, uh, hang on. It's going to test. Two is less than 10. Yes. It's going to write out two. If two is less than three, which it is, oh, continue, I go back up to the top. Now SY index is three. Three is less than 10, so I come in here again. I write out the three. If three is less than three, it's not. So I jump here and write out end if. I go back up to the top and now it's four. So I write out four. I fail this test, so I write out after end if, go back up and then continue until SY index hits 10. So in fact, the last number written to the screen is nine. And then ultimately, I fall out of the, the loop. Now, once again, my example here is very, very hypothetical. But you could perhaps see the value of this in trapping error conditions or in trapping a situation where maybe there are a whole bunch of valid values, but two or three values that are exceptions. And so I code up perhaps a continue to handle uh, those exceptional statements in my, in my program here. So we'll see undoubtedly some examples of where this would be useful this semester. But continue and exit can be really, really useful for us. Any questions about either of those? So I have one more thing to add. And that is the check statement. Now, what the check statement is, is this is going to check a particular conditional proposition that you have set. And if that condition is false, it will restart the loop. So it's kind of like saying, OK, check and make sure that x is less than 1,000. And if x is, in fact, less than 1,000, then you get to keep going in your code. But if x fails that test condition, you go back up to the top and start executing the next time through the loop. So here would be an example of source code that does that. Um, while sy index is less than 10, write out sy index. Or write out, that's a typo there. That should say sy index, not xy dash index. And so I'm going to check. OK, is sy index less than 3? And so you're basically saying check to make sure that's the case. And if it is the case, thumbs up, we keep going. But if I fail that check condition, I don't exit the loop. I just go back up and start the next lap. So this will, in fact, write out, well, let's play computer and see what it's going to write out. It's going to write out 1, and then after check. It's going to write out 2, after check. It's going to write out 3, and then at that point, it's going to write out 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and then be done. Questions? All right, well, your homework program that you are going to work on will give you the opportunity to practice a little bit with this. Um, let's 
debating on whether or not we should take some time and write a practice program together. And I think we have some time, so, so let's do that. Grab a piece of paper and let's write some code, and I'll give you a chance to get a head start, and then we'll work on this together. So here's what you're going to do. You're going to prompt the user for three values, a starting number, an ending number, and a count by number. And once you have that, what you're going to do is you're going to print the loop counter at the beginning of each line of output, followed by a colon. And then starting at the designated starting number, count by the number indicated up to the ending number, realizing that you might not hit that exactly. And you don't ever want to print a number higher than the ending number. So let's say the user said start at 2, end at 10, and count by fives. So you would print out 2, 7, and be done. Or if the user said start at 2, and count by twos up to 20, you would write out 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. And let's see if it says what to do. Starting at the designated number, count the number indicated up to the ending number. You may not hit the ending number exactly, but don't print a value beyond the ending number. So in this case, I would print out the 20. And it just says output this number in column 10. And I know I said do this with all three types of looping structures, but just pick the one that you think would be best here. Okay, so I'll give you, uh, that's a pretty complex one. I'll give you a few minutes here for you to work on the solution. And take note of the spec because I'm going to black the screen and I'm going to work on a solution uh, that we can look at together here. So starting number, ending number, count by number, print out the line, co line counter with your output, and then um, output the number in column 10. But that's a pretty minor thing. All right, so any questions about that before I black the screen? I see a lot of people who look like they're done. So you might not be finished yet. I'm going to suggest to you there are some interesting things in this program that we need to account for that you might or might not have uh, addressed in your design. So let, let's take a look at this. Here is some code that I just threw together and potential answer to this problem. So I'm going to ask the user for three numbers, a starting number, an ending number, and a count by number. And I'm going to, in fact, make all of those obligatory because I have to get those values for this program to work. And then I'm going to introduce a counter variable. Technically, I could get by without the counter variable, but I think it does make the logic a little clearer. And so the counter is kind of the active number in my counting sequence that I'm going to work through. So I will initialize the counter to the starting value. And so all I'm going to do in this proposed solution is while my counter is less than the specified ending number, I'm going to write out my loop counter, and then I'm going to write out the counter value, putting the counter value in column 10. And then I'm going to increment my counter by the count by number, fall out of the while loop, and then return back up to the top and continue iterating as long as my test condition is true. So I would suggest to you that this is similar to a really good answer to this program, but it does have a, a couple of issues. But before we turn our attention to the issues, let, let's run test this guy and, and see if it looks like it works for us. And so I'm going to uh, run this, and I'm going to say, okay, let's start with three, and let's end with 25, and let's count by four. So I would expect 3, 7, 11, 15, 19, 23, and that to be the end of it. So let's see what happens. 3, 7, 11, 19, and 23. Problem. What's the problem? go back and look at my code. This is an example. 
of, and the reason why I did this on purpose is because you will potentially drive yourself crazy this semester with the problem that I am about to illustrate. So make sure that, that you, you pay close attention here and hopefully you'll remember it when this happens to you. All right, let's look at my, whoops, gotta hit back one more time. Let, let's look at my right statement. Is it not true that my right statement clearly has me writing out two values? I'm going to write out SY index, I'm writing out a colon, and then I'm writing out my counter. So it's clear to me that my right statement should be putting a number, a colon, and a number in my output. So let's try this again. Start at 4, end at 44, and then count by 5. If I had a coin, I would pull it out right now and give it to whoever can give me a correct answer to this. I don't have a coin, though. I have a plastic spoon, though. I don't know if that's of any value. I could give this to anybody who could answer. Um, anybody figure out what's wrong here? I told you about this problem once before, but it's obvious you don't remember. <laughs> Here's what happens. I'll just play computer on the, on the whiteboard here with the output. Let's say that I'm, I'm doing the first time through the loop. So it's going to write out for SY index 1, and then it's going to write out a colon. But my question to you is this. Where does this 1 go? And the answer to that is, what data type? is this number right here. What data type is that? Most likely. It's an integer, right? Does it put this number in, in column one? The answer is no. Because remember, integers are capable of holding a whole bunch of, of numbers here. And so in fact, what it's going to do is it's going to left pad spaces and write out the number one. Remember we said this is like buying a new car and you just registered your first mile on the odometer? It doesn't print out all the zeros, but it skips spaces and just writes out the number one and then puts a colon there. And then this says, oh, write out the, the counter in column 10. So it says, oh, OK your counter is three. And it writes it right over the top of that. So how do I fix this? Ah, my good friend the star will fix this for me. So if I come here and I say, all right, write out SY index, but get rid of the spaces at the beginning. I, I don't want those guys. Now let's see what happens. I don't remember what numbers I used a second ago, so we'll do three. 33 counting by fours, see what we get, and we get that. You will make that mistake this semester, and it will drive you crazy because you'll be convinced the computer is not following your instructions. And it is, it's just following them to the letter, and you forgot about the fact that you have to account for those extra spaces. And by the way, technically I should drop a no gap after SY index just to make it prettier, but I'm not gonna bother with that. So, this is a candidate for a valid solution. Is it a good answer? My answer to that is no. And let me show you why. Let's start at three and let's count to 33, counting by negative two. So let's think what's gonna happen here. Three, it's gonna write three to the screen, then it's gonna add the counter, which in fact is going to cause it to now be one, and I'm now moving the wrong direction on the number line, and I'm never going to hit 33. But let's see for ourselves. Now you will notice I'm not actually seeing output, but you can see at the top 
that's telling me, yeah, the computer is, is doing, and it's kind of, I guess you could say, it's so busy doing what I've asked, it hasn't had time to produce the output. Because typically what ABOP will do is it will create all your output and then send it back to you on one block. So I don't know what number it's on by now, but it's still counting. And at some point it will stop. But I don't know how long we'd have to sit here and wait for it to stop. And so I'll show you our stop transaction, which you'll notice will take a second now for even that to work. But it is trying now to stop the transaction. And when it did, it just broke me out of, of SE80 altogether. Now, I was careful, I think, to save my program. You will notice, by the way, that it's still um, you know, it, it's still got some stuff going on, so it's going to be a little bit slow here until the system decides to, because I've, I've disconnected from my execution of that program thread, thread, but it is still actually running on the server. It will eventually kill itself in the background, but this way at least I can get back to work, although it's going to punish me a little bit by being a little slow here because of what I did. And... Um, I can go back into my program, which I should take care not to execute again, and, and there is my program. So we clearly need to account for the situation where what? what what's, my, what's my error condition here? All right, let's say if we did, if count by is less than zero, well, that would mean that I would have to count in a positive direction. But let me ask you this. Suppose the user put in start 7 and 4 count by 2. Now we've got the same thing going on, but in the opposite direction. Technically, according to my spec, the user should be able to say start at 4, end at 0, count by negative 1, and I would count 4, 3, 2, 1. So it's not quite so simple as far as what my test condition here should be. Um, If it's not between, okay, give, give me what you think would be suggested code here. And, and there's more than one way for us to accomplish this. Okay. All right, so we have, we have two choice. You know, we could be really, really verbose about this, or we could probably find an elegant solution. But to start off with, let's just be really verbose, which is we could have if count by is greater than zero. And by the way, why did I put greater than zero? Because what happens if the user says start at three, end at five, count by zero? I just create another infinite looping situation. So if I did this, if count by is greater than zero, um, if, all right, so I know I'm counting by a positive number, and so now I could say if start is greater than end, all right, I've, I've got an error condition here, right? If count by is greater than zero and start is greater than end, I, I know I have a problem. And I don't know that I've told you this before, but if I am in a program that um, I'm not in a loop, but I want to terminate the program, I can use the exit statement to terminate the program. So I could do this now. I could say write, um, and I'll just be vague here, error condition, exit, and if, and if. And this is a good illustration of now nested if loops. Now, let's check and see. So I'm saying, OK, if count by is greater than 0, but my start number is bigger than my end number, um, I've got an error condition. So let's see if this works to clean this up. So direct processing. And it kind of looks like the computer is still working on stuff in the background. Um, so I'm going to start at 3. 
Uh, let's make sure it works on a normal condition. n by 12, uh, count by 2, then I'm good. Okay. But what was my error condition if my um, count by was, was greater than 0, which this is, but my end number is out of whack? So 3 to 1, 2, uh, now I'm going to see error condition and my program ends. Now, you might look at this and say, well, hold on a second. Um, if we look at my code here, could I not do, if count by is greater than zero and start is greater than end, then write out my error condition and exit the program. And I would check and I would say to you, yep, that looks like that would work to me as well as a as a way of accomplishing this. Now, I still would have to account for the alternate count by, which is if count by is less than zero, and I might even need a case for if count by is equal to zero. Now, I'm not suggesting to you that we couldn't find a more elegant solution that might involve subtracting one of the, one of the endpoint numbers from the other and, and checking it. But at least we, we know um, that this right here would be one viable solution to it. So some good examples of why something that looks really, really easy at first glance, you want to really make sure you think about all the possible values that the user could, could put in. Okay? And I don't know, well, I don't have the code set up for checking for negative numbers, and for the sake of time, we won't put it here. But good illustration of looping and conditional code and another use of the exit statement. Any questions? Uh, yes. Okay, all right, that's a good question. So if I did this, and I've got to be careful how I space this out. Okay, and now you want to put in your next error condition, which would be or count by, what did you want to do, less than zero, and start Okay. So everybody understand what's proposed here. Notice I'm not getting a syntax error. So that's a good sign because I at least know that this is syntactically correct. So now I run this and we should have picked up the error, other error condition, which would be what if I say start at 3, end at 22, count by negative 2, and I get error condition. Yeah. So there's only one other test condition I would actually need here, which is what? Yep, count by equals zero is going to be problematic for us. And I would probably in this situation, just for clarity's sake, go ahead and put parentheses around this guy right here, even though we probably could get away with those not being there. And I would bring this down to a rollover line like so. And I think we now have accounted for all of the potential error conditions. Good. Other questions? All right, so that is looping. I have a handout for you. So, can you send these around? Yes, sir. Um, sequence, selection, and iteration. Okay, and give me a second here because the source code that I just gave you, I want to put in my IDE. Now, just to be clear, the source code I gave you, I don't think illustrates anything we don't already know. I'm just giving it to you as a uh, starting point so you don't have to write down all the code that we're about to look at here. And we will use this as a as a practice structure here. Now you might notice on my handout 
that, um, and I did not fix this, but it does not match up with our coding standard. And so if I come here, once I have this in my IDE, and hit my pretty printer button, formatting was not executed because it was switched. Oh, I haven't set up my pretty printer. Let me do that real quick. Let's see here. I've got to remember where that is. It's a... Uh, utilities? Anybody remember where the pretty printer is? We set it up on our very first uh, homework assignment. And I don't remember where it actually is. So I'm going to cheat. And I'm going to go back to our homework assignment and see uh, where that menu path. I know it's in a menu pathway. I don't remember where, though. Create a new program. Uh, bless you. OK, here we go. Utilities settings. Eventually, I would have found it. Utilities settings. Uh, pretty printer, convert uppercase, uppercase, check, and there we go. So there's a good review of our pretty printer. So very simple code sequence I've given you here. We define a, a simple structure capable of storing information about a person, specifically their title, Mr., Mrs., whatever have you. Um, first name as a string, last name as a string. I create a sample person that matches that. I store their title. And because some titles do have punctuation associated with it and some do not, I do think it's reasonable to do what I did here, which is put the punctuation for Mr. as part of the title. And then you see we just write this out to the screen. So I think a pretty straightforward code sequence. Uh, let's run test this and make sure we understand what's going on here. And there's Mr. Robert Johnson. Okay, so um, something new about structures that I don't know that I've told you before, but I think is uh, pretty straightforward, which is suppose I want to copy an entire structure to another structure. And the way that I can do that is with the move corresponding statement. So let me show you how this would work um, in my editor here. I'm going to create another data. And this will be sample person two, type person struct type. So what I'm saying to you is you cannot do uh, sample person two equals sample person. That is, that is not valid logically. So what we would have to actually do here is say move dash corresponding. And the logic here is backwards. So now I say move corresponding. And this is basically saying from sample person to sample person to. Now even though it's called move, that doesn't disrupt the fact that sample person will still have Mr. Robert Johnson in it. But it does mean that sample person to now has Mr. Robert Johnson in it. But the real value of move corresponding, and I'll tell you, there is also just the keyword move by itself. But a good reason to get in the habit of move using move corresponding is, I'm, I'm going to real quick introduce another structure definition. And I'm going to call begin of people struct. And people struct has, um, let's say, ID number, type N, length 5. And it has a annual salary, type uh, P, length oh, 8, decimals 2. And it has a first name and a last name. Okay, so clearly people struct type is really, really similar to my person struct type in that they both have a last name and a first name field that's compatible with one another. So if I now say, okay, data sample person two, 
is type people struct type. What's going to happen in my code as it is written? Well, it's going to look at sample person and it's going to say, okay, sample person has fields type or title, first name, and last name. And it's going to look at sample person too and say, okay, int type, it has ID number, annual salary, first name, and last name. So it's going to copy first name into first name and it's going to copy last name into last name and it's going to leave everything else alone. It's going to ignore the fact that it doesn't have a place to put title. It's just going to skip that. And it's going to leave ID number and annual salary totally untouched because it had nothing to move actually into that. So now, if just to illustrate this, if I come back here and I write out uh, sample person 2, and I'm going to have to make other adjustments beyond this, of course, but we'll do sample person two, only has first name and last name, so I'll get rid of title here. And what we should now see in this situation is, oh, did I mess up? Oh, this should say end of people struct type. And I didn't put in the return to take us to the next line, but you can see that it did, in fact, move Robert and Johnson over to the new structure. We will use this technique a lot as the semester goes on, um, as we start working with databases in particular. Yes, sir? Does the add plane copy the whole bunch of data, or does it use the array? It's copying the data. It's copying it. Good question. Other questions? All right, time for us to learn about a new, not just a new data type, but really a new kind of data type, which is an internal table. Fun fact about ABOP, we do not have arrays in ABOP. We, they don't exist as a data type. Um, so what do we have that would be uh, similar to arrays? We have an internal table. And an internal table is a collection of data objects that all have to be of the same type. So technically speaking, an internal table could be a table of ints, which would very much be similar to an array of ints in another programming language. We could have an internal table of floating point numbers or an internal table of strings which would be logically and functionally the same as arrays in other programming languages. But although we can do that, the most common internal tables we will create are based on structures. And I think you will see very, very quickly here why that is the case. Because this allows us to create a data structure in our table, excuse me, in our program that very much resembles a database table. The distinction being, of course, that a database table is stored in the database, and we're talking about creating something that's in active memory in a given program. So let me go over here and see if I can find a marker that works well and draw you a picture of what I'm talking about. So you'll see the syntax for this in a moment. But let's say that I have created, like on your handout, this, uh, this person struct. Okay? And we said that the person struct has a title, title, a first name, and a last name. So all I have done here is illustrated my structure writing it horizontally. Well, what an internal table allows me to do is create an array of these guys, which at this point you can pretty clearly see that this looks a lot like the way we illustrate a, a database table. So this is going to be very, very useful for us 
either for working with database tables or for doing things in our program that are like database table type operations, but just exist for the duration of a particular program. So we're going to have to learn how to create these internal tables. But then after that, we'll turn our attention into how to work with these internal tables. And you'll see that a lot of the syntax actually looks similar to working with database tables. We can append to an internal table. We can insert into an internal table. We can delete lines. We can edit lines. So we create this structure. And then in our program, we may fill it with data. So I trust you can very easily understand how in our program, we might create one of these guys and then fill it by querying a database and store the result from the database query in this internal table. And then manipulate that internal table in some fashion in our program, maybe to produce a report, dump this to output, maybe to edit this information and then send it back to the database in the form of an update. So we do a lot with internal tables in ABOP programming. I I'm going to pick a statistic off the top of my head, but I would bet that over 50% of ABOP programs written will use internal tables because they're just very, very commonly used anytime we work with the database we are almost always going to have one of these in our program. Now, the great thing about these internal tables, the size is totally dynamic. The number of records, the number of rows that I could have in my data structure obviously depends on how wide it is, but I'm really only limited by the capacity of the system. So whereas in some languages you have to predefine how big your array is going to be, or you might have to resort to something like a linked list to allow you to dynamically grow or shrink. We don't have to worry about that in ABOP. ABOP, we use internal tables, and the system manages the growing and shrinking and the sizing of it as, as might be appropriate in, in our given program. Very, very useful data structure. Uh, useful for temporarily storing data retrieved from or to be added to a database for processing, preparing chunks of data for output, preparing data for other use. Um, we'll do a lot with internal tables over the course of the semester. But our task for today is how do we create these guys? Well, we need to back up one little bit before we start looking at specific syntax. Data in these internal tables can be accessed only two different ways. I can access the data sequentially, which means I could start at row one and traverse through the table uh, moving down, as I've drawn it here, the records or rows that are a part of my individual table. So I can access the table sequentially, or I can search the table using values that I have denoted as keys. Or I could search the table based on indexes, which is just another way of saying row numbers. So I can access and use this table working sequentially, which a lot of times is all I'll need to do because I want to start at the top and end at the bottom, processing however many records happen to be in here. Or indexes, you know, I can say, show me what's in record three, show me what's in record seven, show me what's in record two, and the system will comply with that. It has no problem. But if I want to search my internal table based on values, for the sake of performance, the system will only search based on fields that are designated as keys. So what I'm telling you is I could create this table and say that last name is a key. And if I say that last name is a key, and here's uh, Mr. Jones, and here's Miss Smith, and uh, Mr. Phillips, 
Well, I could say, show me all the matching records where the last name is equal to Smith. And it can do that, no problem, because last name is a key field. But if first name is not designated as a key, I can't say, show me all the people whose first name is Tom. If I wanted to be able to do that, I would just have to say that first name is a key as well. And I could designate as many columns as I want to, or as many fields, if you want to think of it that way, as keys. But I shouldn't get overambitious here and make things keys that really don't need to be keys, because I'm forcing the computer to do work that it really doesn't need to do, which is going to impact my performance. So it's a really, really nice data structure that once I fill it with data, I have a variety of different ways that I can actually work with that, that information. The other thing that comes into play here, and where you're going to have to kind of divorce yourself from things that you might um, be thinking of in the context of database programming, I could say that this internal table has last name as a key, and I can have duplicate values. You know, normally in a database table, if a field is designated as a key field, you couldn't therefore have multiple Mr. Joneses, which is why if this were a database table, we might introduce an ID number or a social security number or something that we would make part of the key that would enable it to be unique. But we don't do that with internal tables, or at least we don't have to do that. We can have keys that have non-unique values. And we only do that for the sake of facilitating searching and for recognizing that what we're going to pull into an internal table may be a subset of a database table where I'm not going to move over the unique fields because they don't really need to be part of my solution. If I were printing out, for example, mailing labels, the person's ID number doesn't need to be moved from the database into my program because I'm not going to put that in part of my output, so why bother putting it in my internal table? So when I define a table, I define what fields are keys, and those keys can be unique or can be non-unique. Searching an internal table with non-unique keys may result in more than one record being returned. So I could have multiple people with the last name Jones in this table, and if I say, give me all the people with the last name of Jones, I could get three people back, I could get 30, I could get one, I could get zero. So we have to realize there are some ways in which this is similar to database work, but also um, a little bit different as, as well in actual application. There are three different types of internal tables. We have a standard table, which I would say is likely the most commonly used. In a standard table, there's no inherent order to the rows. So in that respect, it's very similar to a database table. And so when I access a standard table, I can access it by searching based on key values, or I could access it based on row number, which is another way of saying that I could access it sequentially or jump to particular rows. So that's a standard table. You might not understand how that's distinct until I show you another table, which is a sorted table. A sorted table will always sort the values in the table based on the key fields. And the system does that for you automatically. So hypothetical scenario, I want you to write a program that prints out mailing labels for all of our customers. You do a database query and you pull all of the customer information into an internal table, only pulling the fields that you need. And because you want the output to be alphabetized by last name, you understand, of course, that in a typical select from a database, the database is just going to give it back to you in the inherent order that it's stored in the database, which is not going to be alphabetic, most likely. So what I can do is if I define this table to be a sorted table with last name as the key, 
then what it's going to do is it's going to execute the query. And as it's bringing back the query, it's going to order my internal table based on the key field that I've defined. So a sorted table, the system will automatically maintain the sort order based on the keys. And notice it does say keys. I could say, for example, sort it by last name, then by first name, and then by some other criteria, for example. So I have, uh, with a sorted table, just as with the standard table, I can access it by row number sequentially, and I can access it by searching based on key values. My last table is a hashed table. Now, depending upon programming classes you've taken in the past, you might have done some things with hash tables before. The idea behind a hash table is we pick up significant performance when we sort, or actually, let me take that back, we pick up performance when we search. If I want to create a hashed table, the keys have to be unique because the hashing algorithm is going to be based on the key. So I think we, we didn't explicitly observe what our rules here are about uniqueness for standard and sorted, but we now see that for a hash table, the key has to be unique, and the only way I can access a hash table is by key values. So if I made this table that I've drawn on the screen, if I made it a hash table, and I said last name is the key field, then in that being the case, I could not have multiple people with the same last name, which seems problematic in this application, but let's assume that it's not. So I have to have unique last names, let's assume that's okay. The only way I can pull values out of this table is by some kind of statement that would say something like, give me the person whose last name is Smith. There's no inherent order so I can't work through a hash table sequentially, and I can't jump to particular rows. The only way I can pull things out of a hash table is by value, specifying values for things that are unique keys. Questions? All right, so when we get together on Tuesday, we'll start learning the syntax of this. And we're getting ready to be able to start working with internal tables, which will then lead us to start being able to work with database tables, which will let us start doing some really, really cool things in our program. So that is what is coming up. If you would, please, for the sake of some examples I'm going to give you next time, bring your handout back with you next time. And if you did not uh, get opportunity to sign in, please, please make sure that you do that before you head out. See all of you. Uh, when we get together next week, have a great rest of the day.